All right, and welcome everyone. Welcome to Optic Nerve Grand Rounds. You've got some nerve. Our presenter tonight's gonna be uh, Dr. Joe Salka. I'm gonna be your moderator and we also have Vanessa as our COPE administrator. Uh, Joe is our speaker. Joe served as professor of optometry at Nova Southern University College of Optometry for 28 years. While at the School of Optometry, he was the Chief of Advanced Care Service, the Director of Glaucoma Service, and the Chair of Department of Optometric Sciences. Joe also is a founding member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and the Optometric Retina Society. He also is the Chair of Neuroophthalmic Disorders in Optometry for the American Academy of Optometry. So Joe has done a lot uh, within, uh, uh, within those societies and the American Academy of Optometry, but he didn't stop there. Joe is a gifted writer with hundreds of published articles, and you might recognize him as the lead author of the Annual Handbook of Ocular Disease Management, and that's by the Review of Optometry. Joe is a gifted writer, but we're going to find out tonight that Joe is a very gifted lecturer. He's a well-known national international lecturer. Joe recently, almost about a year ago, moved to Sarasota, Florida, and is with the Center of Sight. So with that being said, let's give Joe a big virtual round of applause. Joe, thank you for being here. It's all yours. All right. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Vanessa. I'm going to turn over the, I'm going to turn over to you the assistance for anybody who's coming in with the uh, wrong link. I got a number of people in. So it's my turn to uh, talk. Optic nerve grand rounds, you got some nerve. Now these are my disclosures. And there's, there's, no, there's nothing pertinent to this lecture. Uh, I am indeed a co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants with Greg. So this is a, a, a case-based uh, lecture. We're gonna start off with a 28-year-old female who presents with intermittent blur vision and visual gray outs, intermittent horizontal double vision and chronic headache steadily worsening over two weeks. Now she claims white coat hypertension and a shoulder injury for which she is using Flexril. Now her height and weight, she's five foot three, 220 pounds. She is 20, 20 in each eye. Pupils and motilities are both normal. Hey Joe, she, adjust that microphone. I think you have it up a little high wherever, wherever it is or move it a little bit closer to you. Is this better, Greg? Yeah, much better. Yeah. Okay. So here she is, and she has bilaterally swollen, swollen optic nerves with some juxtapapillary hemorrhages. You can see some folds in the retina known as Patton's folds between the disc and the, uh, and the macula. And this is really characteristic of advancing and regressing parapapillary retinal edema. And there are a number of things we have to consider, a uh, number of tests we're gonna have to perform on this woman. And that brings me, Greg, to polling question number one. What is, is the next? What is the next medical test that this patient needs? Is it MRI, MRV, CT, LP, or I don't know. And I'm just responding to somebody right now. I think we're getting pretty close there, Greg. Yeah, they're rolling in there. Experienced poll takers. So we'll end it. I will share the results and you can go over them. So what's the next medical test? Uh, number one's been MRI. We have MRV, they're very low. CT is up there. Lumbar puncture is fairly high. And I don't know is actually an adequate answer because that's that's why, you know, that that's why you're here. Well, she has a dull ringing in her ears. Her blood pressure was elevated, but it was not malignant hypertension uh, realm. Biomicroscopy is unremarkable. Pressure is normal. Feels she has enlarged blind spot and nasal defects in each eye. Serology is normal. She did undergo imaging with small ventricles. Otherwise, it was, uh, it was normal. Lumbar puncture opening was 510, which should be about 250. Uh, CSF was all normal. Her diagnosis was pseudotumor cerebral. 
but really she had papilledema, and that's edema of the optic disc, specifically from elevated intracranial pressure. Now, signs and symptoms of papilledema. Papilledema is not a clinical diagnosis. It's at best a clinical suspicion. We, we don't know that it, it is papilledema, but we know there's increased intracranial pressure. Bilateral disc edema is the norm. I've only seen one case of unilateral papilledema, and it usually, like glaucoma, affects the superior and inferior aspects of the disc first. There's obliteration of the cup. Hemorrhages are, are going to be common. There's going to be loss of the visibility of the, of the vessels superiorly and inferiorly. The, the smaller vessels and the major vessels will be obscured. There'll be no spontaneous venous pulsation, and it, as I discussed, patents fold is representative of advancing and regressing edema. And that is actually pretty characteristic of true papal edema. Now, visual field defects are variable. It early is going to be a large blind spot, but arcuate defects and very constricted visual fields will come later in the disease. And this is actually a blinding potentially disease. There's no relative afferent defect typically because it's symmetrical. Usually acuity is, uh, is pretty normal. Now symptoms, transient visual obscuration from cessation of axoplasmic flow and blood flow and intermittent horizontal diplopia from a unilateral or bilateral six nerve paresis. Headache is common, very, very common. Nausea and vomiting can, can occur and the nausea and vomiting or, or vomiting without nausea, the vomiting is an act to uh, dehydrate and reduce intracranial pressure. So when people have projectile vomiting, that is a sign of increased intracranial pressure. And they can have dizziness and tinnitus as well. Now, papilledema can be acute, it can be chronic, or it can be atrophic. Acute, it's pretty mucky and turbid. There are hemorrhages, there's exudation, there's hyperemia. There's nerve fiber layer edema, as we see in the lower left. Chronic is a little drier. There's minimal hemorrhage, minimal exudate. And there may be some collateral vascularization that will uh, develop. And atrophic, as we see in the lower right, if papilledema is chronic and disc edema is chronic, it's, it's going to flatten out because dead things don't, don't swell and, and you, they can end up with optic disc power. And the edema is, is from cessation of axoplasmic flow. And this is a regurgitation uh, of metabolic waste products at the level of the optic nerve because cerebral edema and increased cerebral spinal fluid pressure is really being transmitted along these common meningeal sheaths of the brain, the optic nerve, giving this, us this, this engorged, swollen optic nerve. Now, papilledema can be due to increased brain volume from a, from a mass lesion, as we see in the lower left. Increased intracranial blood volume from an hemorrhage that we see in the middle, and increased cerebral spinal fluid volume from something like hydrocephalus or ventricular blockage by a mass lesion. Now, you don't have to have a huge tumor to increase intracranial pressure. A small tumor blocking cerebral spinal fluid, fluid flow leading to the hydrocephalic state can do it as well. So these are all things that are possible. Now, of course, we want to rule out the swollen disc masqueraders. Uh, ultrasound can be helpful in identifying disc drusen. Uh, uh, Bundes autofluorescence can be very helpful. And we also want to look at the color, the margins, look for spontaneous venous pulsation, and abnormal vascular branching patterns like a trifurcation. These are all things that are kind of pointing toward patients with, with um, an anomaly. Now, acute papilledema, I mean, if, if you think that's what it is, is a medical emergency. They need neuroimaging to rule out an intracranial mass lesion. And if that imaging is normal, they need a lumbar puncture to measure the CSF and you know, exclude meningitis and other infections that might be, be going up. Atrophic papilledema with significant visual field constriction is an emergency because you've got to quickly move to prevent blindness. And suspected disc edema with any neurologic abnormalities, fever, stiff neck, is indicating probably an intracranial infection. Again, that also is an emergency. Now, how do we handle these patients? You know, the people that come in that have, are, are largely not symptomatic, and there's a question about the, is a swelling of the optic nerve or not? 
and you really can't tell, you have some time to figure, you know, to, to, to figure it out and do in your office what we do, because once they get downstream, certain things aren't going to be done. Fundus photograph, visual fields, OCT, pupil testing, color vision testing. These are all things that are important in the suspected disc edema. Now, if you think you have raging disc edema, you, you got champagne corks into the vitreous, and we have a really what you think is acute papilledema, this is a person that should probably be best sent to an emergency room, but don't send without information. When a person goes to the ER, they're going to end. They're going to end up getting a, a, a CAT scan of the brain, often without contrast, to rule out stroke. ER physicians don't know what to do. They need our help. Give this information as to what you're thinking of. Now, I do want to clear, clarify this. I, I know Greg and I have talked about this a lot. Pseudo tumor versus IIH or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I'm going to I'm going to give you the wisdom here to help you differentiate. One term is a really good term and it's still used and that's pseudo tumor. Pseudo tumor just means increased intracranial pressure but there's no tumor. But there have been other causal agents identified. Hypervitaminosis A, oral tetracycline and minocycline use, oral contraceptives, venous sinus thrombosis, these are all things that have been identified as causing increased intracranial pressure. And when they're present, we call it secondary pseudotumor. Now, there is a subset of people who have increased intracranial pressure, but there's no identifiable cause. They tend to be younger females who may have just gained weight or are over their ideal body weight. And when there's no other causative factor associated, we call that IIH or primary pseudotumor. So pseudotumor is still a good term. And the use of IIH to apply to all these patients is really not appropriate, especially if they're using minocycline or have a venous sinus thrombosis. So pseudotumor is very good. It's either primary IIH or secondary. There's identifiable causes. And it's probably due to poor cerebral spinal fluid drainage. Now, diagnosing pseudotumor, you need signs and symptoms that I discussed that are consistent with increased intracranial pressure, papilledema, and it can be subtle. And they have to have a normal neurologic evaluation. There can't be anything else going on except cranial nerve six palsy. That is allowed in a unilateral or bilateral, and I'll explain why. Neuroimaging has to be normal, has no hydrocephalus, no mass, no blood, no structural lesion, and no venous sinus thrombosis. Now, the CSF has to be normal, no blood, no white cells, and the LP has to be open, you know, opening pressure has to be elevated. In adults, it's usually over 250, and children, it's usually over 280. Now, lumbar puncture is getting harder to obtain. And there are some MRI findings that are so characteristic that many physicians are obviating the lumbar function. And it's not wrong. Now, the MRI and the MRV have to show no additional abnormalities. And yes, these people need a magnetic resonance videography looking for transverse sinus and venous sinus thrombosis. The only other thing they can have is an empty or or flattened cell turcica, a flattened globe. We can actually see uh, on the MRI, the back part of the eye is actually not round, but it's actually squashed in. Cell turcica, the, the, the pituitary gland, is this gelatinous structure that gets squashed down into the, into the cell turcica, so it looks like there is no pituitary gland. They have to have no evidence of fever or acute infection. And if they follow a typical profile, of a younger female who might be overweight. You know, all this is very characteristic. And if this is present, many physicians will not do an LP and that's not wrong. So if you find these patients are not getting lumbar puncture, you can understand why. Now management, no visual loss, so headache therapy is what they need. So acetazolamide will work if they can tolerate it and weight reduction, which is very important. 
Now, if they have mild visual loss, acetazolamide can be used along with or, or, or interchanged with furosemide, zonistamide, or topiramate, topiramate. Topiramate is an anti-seizure medication that is used off-label for a number of things, including headache and weight reduction. And it does have weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitor properties. So it's actually a very good medicine to use. And again, weight reduction. So if there's no or only mild vision loss, the prognosis is really very good if we can manage the disease. Uh, everything should resolve within several months. But here's what it's very important for ODs to get involved in follow-up. We need to take the photographs and we need to do the visual field. It's very, very important because downstream, this is not being done with neurology or internal medicine. Now, weight loss is treating the primary problem. And I've heard different, I've heard as low as 5%, but I think the accepted would be about 10%. You need about 10% weight loss in order to solve this problem. And to prevent recurrence, you really need to keep the weight down. And in many cases I've seen, the headaches have worsened with increased weight. And after discussion, I find that patients, when they start losing weight, they start feeling better almost immediately. Here's a nice example of a, of a young female who had bilateral chronic disc edema. You can see how we lose sight of the vessels superiorly and inferiorly. She had a large blind spot and maybe this internal lumpy bumpy, you know, this, this internal appearance is, is rel relatively smooth and not lumpy bumpy as you see with disc drusen. Now on a serous OCT, you have this really hot juxtapare peripapillary area, or what I, I like to refer to as the patriot sign, it's kind of red, white, and blue, tell you that there is really a lot of uh, juxtapapillary edema. One thing I will share, and I think it, it's a very important clinical pearl. And Greg, did you, did you launch the, have you been launching the handout throughout the talk? Okay, I'm sure he probably will. But what I wanna, what I wanna point out uh, is look at the nasal thickness. Neuroretin neuroretinal rim thickness. Neuroretinal rim thickness greater than 88 microns is more associated with optic disc edema than is disc drusen. Now it can be less than 88 and still be early edema, but if it's over 88, it's more associated with disc edema than it is with disc drusen. Here's a female who complained of horizontal double vision. She had a mild six nerve palsy, headache, and transit visual obscurations about 20 times per day. Now, she denied oral contraceptives. She wasn't using any tetracycline drugs, uh, vitamin A uh, she was not using. She had lost about 10 pounds and her headaches improved greatly. Her, her BMI was only about 27. Her blood pressure was not elevated and she was not, not terribly overweight. And what we see is, again, bilateral chronic disc edema. She has a large blind spot in each eye. She has a bit of a superior arthritic defect in the right eye and profound juxtapapillary edema or that patriot sign uh, on OCT. And it's important to do all these tests, photograph, visual field, OCT, because it will help us to follow these patients. And this is what happened to the patient over time as she was treated with Diamox uh, by a neurologist and she started losing a little bit of weight. You can actually see that there is some regression of the edema. And this is where the photographs are crucial because if I look at either one alone independent, I would say there's disc edema, but I can actually see a, an improvement over time. And in her visual field, what was a constricted or slightly reduced field on one has improved as her disc edema is resolved. Now, imagine if I flip these around and we had the arrows going the other way from a clean field to a not clean field or photographically increased uh, amount of disc edema, the neurologist and the interns will need to know this that the patient is actually worsening and we're the best ones to tell these professionals if these patients are truly worsening. Now, if they have severe progressive loss of vision, you can have an optic nerve sheath decompression 
where the sheath is cut and the cerebral spinal fluid can drain out. So that is akin to, I guess, unbuckling your, 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 your pants after Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, the problem is still there, you still a little bit better. IV steroids, IV carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can be done. And in severe cases, a lumboperitoneal shunt can be put in to drain that away. Now, in any patient who has a lumboperitoneal shunt that you know of, who develops headache, that is an emergency because that's indicating that the shunt has become blocked. Greg, that brings me to polling question number two. And uh, so Joe, with that being said, there are some comments that came in regarding this. So um, okay. first, the, what would be the answer for your, for your question here, your polling question before I stop sharing? An MRI before a lumbar puncture, correct? MRI before a lumbar puncture, but also MRV at the same time. Both have to come together. So I'm going to launch the second question. So while that's happening, I'm going to take care of some of these questions or comments that came in. Okay. So uh, the first one was, um, this one's a direct message, so you might not see it. It says, I've seen a handful of pseudotumor cerebrae patients due to minocycline, but never doxycycline. Is it just by chance or does minocycline cross the blood-brain barrier effective, uh, thus causing pseudotumor cerebri? I have heard more, more minocycline than I have doxycycline, but it can happen with doxycycline, so be aware of that. Yeah, it's in the whole tetracycline group. Uh, my lecture with Tracy Offerdahl, who's a, who's a pharmacist, you guys probably saw us share that. And we talk about ocular comp complications of uh, pharmaceutical medicines. It's the whole tetracycline group that that happens to. So, but um, there is a little bit more efficacy with minnow, so that's probably the reason why. Uh, the other, this one here, Joe, says, Joe, should we get a field even if the MRI is negative? Should we get a field if the MRI is negative? Well, the MRI will be negative. The, the MRI should, should, show, should show, show nothing. Now, if the MRI is positive, you've got another, you've got another disease. You may have a brain tumor. You may have a intracranial bleed. So I on your swollen should, nerve heads, are you, getting a ner are you doing visual fields? Yes. Okay. Uh, the handout is launched. And then the last one here, Joe, is what's the timeline for follow-up for pseudotumor cerebral patients since the initial diagnosis? I would do three months, then three months after that, then every six months. And each time you should be doing a field and a photograph and maybe an OCT as well. Because the other medical professionals are not doing these tests. And it's crucial for you to help them to determine if they're getting better or getting worse. Because otherwise, you're just going by symptomatology. They're not redoing the optimal lumbar function. So I think we're, we're, we're probably getting toward the end. Uh, this is a tough one. So when, when encountering fluorid bilateral disc edema in a 39-year-old obese female, what's the next immediate step? I don't think we, you know, prescribe diamox and weight loss. Well, that will be done, but after we have done everything else, Meal check blood pressure. It might be more like a hypertension, not pseudotumor. Sending to the ER is very reasonable. An OCT in your office is good information to have at baseline. And again, I don't know is a good answer because that's why we're all here to learn. So remember that all elevated nerves are swollen. Not all swollen nerves are edematous. Not all edematous discs are truly papilledema. But true papilledema is an urgency and we have to find the cause. And there are other, other conditions that can present with papilledema, including you know, mass lesions, hydrocephalus, venous sinus thrombosis, and pseudotumor. And pseudotumor is a diagnosis of exclusion. Well, the MRI is getting better at it, but we still have to exclude all the other things. I have unfortunately encountered colleagues who have, who have looked at a patient like this and put them on diamox because they could without doing the test. And, being young and, and overweight does not protect against a, a brain tumor. So there's a lot of stuff to remember. I want to remember my O2 swollen disc. When you think the disc is swollen, the vessels north and south will appear stolen. Not all elevated nerves are edematous, just like not all snakes are venomous. Your thoughts should go to papilledema, but infection and inflammation should still be in the schema. 
MRI, MRV, and LT are all soon to be. Remember, pseudotumor is a diagnosis of exclusion, right? Big male and firm does not make it a foregone conclusion. Brain tumors can exist when the profile is classic. Do the evaluation so they don't end in a casket. Got to do the workup. So with that, we're going to move on. Which is better, one or two? Two people with a sense of the same disease, one a distinguished older gentleman, one a distinguished middle-aged gentleman, who both have a similar condition. The first is a 48-year-old male who, who, who complained of a painless loss in visual field that he noticed when he first woke up uh, early one day. He had a flu-like illness uh, three weeks before, which was non-contributory. He had an inferior arcuate defect uh, in one eye. The other eye was clear. And he had a hyperemic swollen optic nerve and a disc at risk, a small non-existent cup in the other eye. And he had a classic non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Compare and contrast that the 74-year-old male who presents with the worst headache of his life. He goes to the emergency department of a VA hospital in the Northeast, sees a physician assistant, an emergency department physician, a cardiologist, a nurse practitioner, all over a three week period, not all at the same time. His histories include eye ache, jaw pain, scalp pain, facial pain, somnolence to the point where he fell asleep while eating his food, malaise and jaw claudication. He was diagnosed with temporal mandibular joint dysfunction by a physician assistant, supported by the emergency room uh, department physician, and put on an NSAID. Came back feeling not any better about a week later. They discovered he had a tick attached to him. So now he was diagnosed with Lyme disease and PMJ. And looking at the record, various specialists had written down vasculitis such as temporal arteritis, highly unlikely. Not GCA, but a sub rate and C reactive protein were ordered and they were elevated, but there's no indication that anybody ever saw or acted on these test results. Ultimately, an optometrist made the diagnosis, but the end result was not very good. Greg, that brings me to polling question three. A 60 year old patient with a headache presents with a pale, swollen optic disc. What is the best referral? Is it a neuro ophthalmologist? a hospital ER, an internist, a retinal specialist, or I don't know. Okay, people are, are working through this. So who do we send this for? The 60-year-old headache person with pale, swollen nerve and end vision loss is a neuro ophthalmologist, an ER, an internist, retinal specialist, or I don't know. I think we should call it here, Greg. Yeah. Okay. Most people say neuro ophthalmologist, and that is a very reasonable answer if you can get the patient in immediately. Otherwise, we have to worry about giant cell arteritis and the fellow eye becoming involved and we want to send them to a hospital emergency room with information to the ER physician as to what you're thinking, what should be done. So they both have anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which is a hypoperfusion of the posterior ciliary circulation of the anterior optic nerve. It can be arteritic or non-arteritic. Now, in non-arteritic, you know, ischemic vascular disease and other mechanical factors are going to have a, a role in it. Whereas in arteritic ischemic neuropathy, this autoimmune vasculitis is going to be the contributor. It typically starts on the unilateral presentation, but there's a very high incidence of fellow eye involvement in arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. In fact, 65% of patients will progress on to bilateral involvement on an average of, of 10 days. So when the patient comes in, the clock is against us. Looking at arteritic versus non-arteritic, arteritic tends to be a pale, swollen optic nerve, often very chalky and white. Whereas non-arteritic ischemic neuropathy due to telangiectatic disc capillaries trying to reperfuse the optic nerve, 
is going to be very hyperemic and swollen. So our, the clinical appearance can be somewhat different. Not arteritic has the risk factors of, of high blood pressure, diabetes, small optic nerve, a small crowded disc at risk. A 0 0.4, 0 0.5 CD ratio is not going to be non arteritic ischemic neuropathy. Six to one is going to be an inferior visual field defect. Okay, it's down there. Okay. They should have it set up. I took care of it for you. Okay. Uh, meeting. Houston, we have a problem. Okay. Hyperemic swollen green, nerve. And then it automatically. Okay. Progressive vision loss with some potential recovery. The vision loss is usually pretty apoplectic, but it can progress up to about a week. And these are younger patients. The law, they're always, I, I've come across the, is the late 30s and early 40s, but it can really go all up to death. And it's painless, very important that painless loss of vision. Arteritic ischemic neuropathy has got a very pallid, swollen optic nerve, and there's pain of some sort, head pain, jaw pain, scalp pain, face pain, eye pain, girdle pain, shoulder pain. You know, these people have what is known as hair, chair, stair, fair. Hair, hurts when they comb their hair. Uh, fair, they tend to be Caucasian. Chair, they can't get out of chairs very easily. And, and stair, they have trouble walking upstairs. Visual field defects, if they're measurable, tend to be inferior defects. And giant cell arteritis and polymyalgia rheumatica are, are clearly risk factors for this autoimmune neuropathy. Once you get patients over the age of 50, it's always on the menu. It's not common under age 60, and it's typically patients are in the 70s or 80s. And there's a high risk of progression to bilateral involvement. So I really have to ask about the non-visual symptoms. Headache is very, very common. Scalp tenderness. It's not pain while chewing, but fatigue. They, it's like you're eating beef jerky or a tough steak. It's not like a, it's not like a sharp pain. It's, it's really a dull ache and a fatigue. Ear pain, temple pain, intermittent fevers. These are all findings that are characteristic of giant cell arteritis. Of course, we're going to examine them and look for that pallid swollen optic nerve. And lab studies, SED rate is, is the go-to test, but it can be lowered by statins and NSAIDs. And about 10% of patients are going to have a normal SED rate. Now, C-reactive protein is not going to be as effective. It tends to be a little bit more, more sensitive. And the two together is about 98% sensitive in, di in diagnosing this disease. And of course, they can also have an elevated, uh, elevated platelet count. So treatment is prop steroids and hydration. And when vision loss is involved, they, they, should, be, they should be probably getting IV steroids because one, you know they're getting it. And IV steroids are, are very effective in preventing fellow eye involvement. And sometimes it actually even restores vision in the involved eye. If they're admitted to the hospital for two to three days of IV steroids, IV solubendrol, they're going to do a lot better. And at least you know they're getting the uh, that they're getting the the, the the medicine. So which is better, one or two? This patient went bilaterally blind, which could have been prevented. And this patient has some field loss, but is otherwise overall not bothered. So to help you out here, I want you to remember my ode from ischemic nerve. When your patient's optic nerve is ischemic, you better hope the disc is hyperemic. In non-arteritic, no treatment is needed and life is rarely impeded. But if the disc is swollen and pale and vision is an epic fail, if the patient is 60s, 70s, or 80s, you're going to feel like heat like you're in the 80s. ESR and CRP are required, and steroids must be acquired. Remember that whenever you see a choked disc, always assess the giant cell risk. And if you can remember that, that will keep you out of trouble with ischemic nerves. She's a 29-year-old female referred for a glaucoma evaluation due to suspicious cupping, but no complaints. Her pressure was 12 and 13. I used to see this in the glaucoma servers all the time. Uh, a suspicious looking nerve without risk factors. The patient was sent in. And my first approach would always be, let's, let's get a normal OCT and send the patient home. So I run an OCT and the nerve fiber layer in the left eye and the ganglion cell complex in the left eye 
are matching one another or actually abnormal. And this would occasionally happen to I me. Mean, I knew this patient did not have glaucoma. So my approach is let's run a visual field. So I run the visual field and the visual field comes out clean in the right eye, but a small little nasal step, which is reproducible on the same day in the left eye, which actually matches the OCT findings. So now I get, get serious. It's not glaucoma, but there's something else going on. She's 2015 right and left eye, and the pressure is 12 with thin corneas, going, going as normal. But what is mark remarkable is she has a relative accurate defect in the left eye, even though she's got good vision and very mild field loss. And when we dilate it, what we see is large cups, robust rims, but segmental pallor from 12 o'clock until 3 o'clock. And this is a patient who has optic atrophy. Greg, what does polling question number four tell us? What does this patient most need? Immediate referral to a hospital ER, immediate referral to a neuro-ophthalmologist, non-emergent MRI of orbits of chiasm, nothing because this is just glaucoma, or I don't know. All right, let's see here. I got a question in. It says, how urgent is the ESR slash C-reactive protein to work up a giant cell patient? If we order it ourselves, is there a way to obtain the results urgently? You can, but if you are, are bringing the patient back, there, there can be some unnecessary delays. Getting, getting, getting him to the diagnostic laboratory, getting it done, getting the results back. If there is vision loss, this is best handled in the ER. But the ER physicians need to know what you're thinking of and what to order. And, and when they do that, how the patient's there, then they can be admitted for IV steroids. So while we can do it ourselves, I will, and I will often do it in older people with headaches or do it through the primary care physician with no vision loss, just as a fishing trip and that's not, not as urgent, but there's vision loss. It's an emergency. You should go to the ER. So but with it, with that being said, with the yeah. ESR and C-reactor protein, are we doing a CBC to look at uh, the, platelets. Uh, the platelets and the uh, hemoglobin? Yes, you can do that as well. So the, so whatever, just so everyone knows, is that uh, the, you know, ESR, you know, goes up. The C-reactive protein goes up. Platelets, for some reason, I haven't really ever been able, maybe Joe, you know, for some reason, the platelets go up, but then the, the hemoglobin goes down. So, and, and the hemoglobin going down is often the cause of the false negative on the ESR. Okay, I think we're, we're about through here, Greg. And so well, they, so another question has rolled in. Yeah. In an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in males, should uh, should you ask about erectile dysfunction medications? The answer is you can ask about that for a non-arboritic. There has been probably, at last count, about 53 cases presented. There are probably more cases that have not been presented. But if you consider the millions upon millions of doses that are used every year compared to the number of cases that have been reported, it's a very weak uh, relationship, but it certainly is worth a conversation. So there are a number of things that people have, have looked at. The first is non-emergent MRI of the orbits and chiasm. And I think that's a very good answer. You know, we have primary optic atrophy, which the disc appears kind of a chalky white, the, mar the margins are pretty distinct and normal. And that is usually typical for trauma and, and compression. Secondary optic atrophy usually comes from chronic disc edema, from, from pseudotumor, papilledema, infiltrative disease, malignant hypertension. And we also have the consecutive optic atrophy from degenerate retinal conditions such as RP, pathological myopia, artery occlusion, uh, people who had PRP. And the, the, the disc is pale, but it's kind of waxy and the, the arterioles are somewhat attenuated. And temporal disc pallor is bilateral, tends to be toxic or nutritional. 
And if it's unilateral, it can be demyelinating disease, such as an old optic neuritis. Now, for optic atrophy, there are many etiologies, but they all must be evaluated. You, you have to have an explanation that's plausible, or you have to do an evaluation. Evaluation should include orbits, uh, MRI of the orbits and chiasm with and without contrast, fat suppression for the orbits in a high field scanning unit. The digadolimia is going to be very helpful in di diagnosing malignant lesions and demyelinating plaques. Systemic causes, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, Bechet's disease, lupus, metabolic disorders, infectious diseases. This is something I prefer to get involved in with a primary care physician and work with him or her in ordering the appropriate tests. There are a number of things that should be done, CBC, CEDRAE, ACE, ANA, uh, double-stranded DNA, cardiolipin, homocysteine levels, B12 levels, folate levels, and RPR for syphilis, and of course, chest x-ray for sarcoid and tuberculosis. And these are at a minimum. And I like working with primary care physicians to do all of this. Now, with this woman, you know, MRI, the orbits and, and orbits and chiasm were normal. I worked with a primary care physician. He, repeat, he repeated the MRI, the MRI of the brain. There were no lesions. Uh, he ordered a, a number of tests which uh, were appropriate that was consulted. They're all normal. And following her over time, her, her visual field defect did not change. So she eventually was, uh, was dismissed, but we didn't have an actual cause. Here's a 56 year old female diagnosed with glaucoma several years ago, solely progressive vision loss. She's light perception in the right eye, 20, 30 in the left. She had not been using her glaucoma medicines and her pressure is 19 and 18. And what we see here is large nerves, thin rims, especially on the right eye, and overall a very pale nerve, especially on the, on the right eye. And I couldn't get a visual field on the right eye because of her poor vision, but her left eye showed a very distinct vertically oriented field defect. Of course, this is a person who needs neuroimaging of the orbits and chiasm, and she came back positive for a uh, large pituitary macroadenoma. So she actually had compressive optic neuropathy. I'm going to pop ahead a little bit. This is compression of the optic nerve in the orbits at the apex or the chiasm. You can have tumor masses, you can have cranial pharyngioma, you can have meningioma, optic nerve sheath glioma, you can have pituitary adenoma, or very importantly, Graves ophthalmopathy. Graves disease is actually the number one cause of, of compressive optic neuropathy, it's not tumors. These are people who present with slowly progressive painless loss of vision. Now the nerve may be initially hyperemic, uh, collateral vessels formation, and they're not, they're not optociliary shunt vessels, they're truly collateral vessels, can develop with prolonged compression. And this is often very characteristic of what we're going to see in, in patients with an optic nerve sheath meningioma. Field loss can be consistent with papilledema, ischemic neuropathy, glaucoma, a chiasmal and retrochiasmal masses are going to have vertically oriented field, uh, field defects. Now, compre compression will actually cause pallor and increased coupling. So certain tumors can cause a concentric enlargement of the optic nerve, but they don't notch the neural retinal rim. Glaucoma is the only disease that actually causes focal notching of the neural retinal rim. Tumors don't do that. So always remember, in an O to a cup disc, to have a cup disc pink, that my friend half the glaucoma to stick. Having a cup disc pale, however, if you call this glaucoma, you will fail. Disc and field damage is one side and simply will not be abided. It might be trauma, infarct, or meningioma, but if the rim is cut, always remember nothing notches a nerve like glaucoma. And Greg, is there anything else in, in the uh, in the chat room? Uh, nope. The last question was about uh, the erectile dysfunction meds, and I relaunched the handout. Oop, I only sent the handout to one person. Sorry. Okay. I will resend the handout. 
All right, so we're going to wrap up with the final case of a 42-year-old female who has a sudden painless loss of vision for a week. Uh, getting worse, not getting better. It was kind of dim. And then it rapidly dropped off. She has 20-20 right eye, 2400 left with mild relative aphorism defect. And I'm, I'm emphasizing mild for a reason. Compensation fields are full peripherally, but she didn't have a central, sequel-central scotoma on Amsler grid. Biomicroscopy was normal, pressures were normal, but her optic nerve was not normal. She has a massively elevated unilateral, you know, the right spine, disc edema, with an accumulation of exudate in Henley's layer pointing toward the macula and what is known as a partial macular star. Now, the fact that this is unilateral points us away from increased intracranial pressure, and it points us away from malignant hypertension. Now, she has no known HIV risk, but she didn't have a bad flu with lymphadenopathy about four weeks before. She doesn't recall a tick bites or rashes, but she does have an exposure to cats and kittens. Serologically, FPA, ABS, and RPR for syphilis were negative, HIV was negative, Lyme negative, toxoplasmosis negative, Toxicoriasis negative, pure, pure protein derivative negative, but she did test positive for Bartonella head cell. That tells us that she has what is called cat scratch neuroretinitis, or more broadly, she has an infectious optic neuropathy. There are a lot of things that can cause infection. Syphilis can give a retrobulbar, a bulbar, a perineuritis or a neuroretinitis. Now, syphilitic neuropathies that are bulbar or retrobulbar usually have a very severe vision reduction that often doesn't come back without treatment. Perineuritis is a swollen edematous optic nerve, but normal vision. If you have a swollen optic nerve unilaterally and normal vision, MRI will show optic nerve sheath enhancement, and that tells us you have a perineuritis. And perineuritis is very commonly caused by syphilis. Lyme disease mimics syphilitic optic neuropathy. Now, syphilis, both are, both are spirochetal bacteria. One is Borrelia burgdorferi, the other is Treponema pallidum. Syphilis is Treponema, Lyme is Borrelia burgdorferi. Now, they are so much alike, they can cross react on, the, uh, on, on lysotiders, meaning patients with syphilis can test positive for Lyme and vice versa. Now Lyme, as we know, is a, a usually a northern disease. It was a bite of a mammalian deer tick. People who are in the, in the fields or in the forest, hunters, people who are around large farm animals, people are, are deer hunters, clo close contact to mammals. These are people who are at risk. Toxoplasmosis, HIV, sudden megalovirus are all infective agents, which are very destructive to vision. But neuroretinitis is typically a benign lymphoreticulosis, which is known as cat scratch disease. Now, the important thing to remember is the RAPD is very mild compared to the vision loss, telling us that in neuroretinitis, it's more retina than it is neuro. These patients will have a serious macular detachment, not, not macular edema, but they'll actually have a separation from the optic nerve to the macula. And that macular star, those macular exudates, are relatively late findings. They usually might take about two weeks or so to develop. And you can have a swollen nerve, like we see here, with no, with no macular exudates, and that is actually still neuroretinitis. Now, how do you know? Your OC with T will tell you there's going to be a separation from here to here in the retina. Here's a female who had strep throat, quote unquote, was being treated with antibiotics for a day, comes in his calc fingers at eight feet, 20-25 left eye, a relatively mild afferent defect in the right eye. And what do we see? There are no exudates here. There's a massively swollen optic nerve, but there is a serous macular detachment, telling, in this, telling us all that right here we're dealing with neuroretinitis. And there are numerous causes of neuroretinitis. The most common is Bartonella, which is cat scratch disease, but 
looking at the possible etiologies, toxoplasmosis, coriasis, maybe with syphilis, Lyme disease, simplex, zoster, mumps, uh, Epstein-Barr. There are just a number of things. So just because it looks like neuroretinitis and looks like cat scratch disease doesn't mean there can't be something else. Now, if it is due to Bartonella infection, which is cat scratch, and fleas actually are the vectors. So you don't really have to have a scratch. It's the fleas and the flea bite that transmits. If this is the cause, prognosis is, recovery is actually very good, even without treatment. There are a number of antibiotics that have been used, ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, uh, but there's been nothing that has proven to, to enhance the overall visual outcome because it's got a good prognosis if it's Bartonella and cat scratch disease. Probably the most common thing to be used would be doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for a month. Unfortunately, sometimes retinal specialists like to inject Avastin a because the retina is, is mucky and turbid but there's no proof that it actually that actually happens. So if you did nothing, if you know what the disease is, Bartonella you did nothing, the patient's going to do well. If it's something else, Lyme disease, syphilis, toxocariasis, well, then that needs to be treated. And it's good to work with infectious disease specialists or interns when ordering all these tests, knowing that our most likely cause is going to be Bartonella. And if it is, they're going to have a good prognosis. They, they will recover with or without treatment. Now, this is a very heady topic. And there's a lot of things to talk about. I'm going to wrap up with what I call my O2 and infectious nerve. When the vision is poor, the APD mild, it's often the bite of something wild. If the disc is swollen and macular swelling great, it's neuroretinitis and the star will come late. Syphilis and Lyme are much alike and will cause similar titers to spike. One is sexually transmitted and the other not, unless the patient's weirder than you thought. And with that, Greg, I think we're going, we're, we're about out of our time. Are there any sort or, or any other questions in the chat? No other questions in the chat. You, uh, you there's nothing else to, to discuss. All right, then if you want to, uh, start wrapping things up for us, Greg, and bring us home. We want to try to end this post on time as possible. Okay, I'm going to switch over that. So with that being said, I want to thank uh, everyone for attending uh, Optic Nerve Grand Rounds. Uh, you've got some nerve, Joe. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, probably the second or third time, but love hearing it. And, uh, it certainly helps me out in the clinic. So the great pearls, love the, love the odes. So thank you for being a great presenter. Um, it was a joy being the host for tonight.